Tell me about the time when you first came to Prague. Right after the, the worst part of the pandemic. And um, the announcement came out uh, that they were renting studios. Um, and so I just saw the opportunity. I just said, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll apply. And, and so I did. And I was accepted. I was very, very excited. I, it seemed like a very wonderful opportunity. Um, so um, I accepted the offer and, and I moved in probably in August of 2020, about four years ago. Um, and that's how it happened. It, it, it just, I walked in, I remember seeing some studios on the back and, um, and then I saw these studios, they were full of light and I thought this was a, just a, a, a very wonderful space to work. Mm -hmm. What were your plans for this studio? Did you have any ideas for works or projects? I had no plans. No, no, no. I, you see, I had been a stone carver for many years. I did a lot of stone, stone work, um, maybe from 1986. I just started carving stone, maybe even 1983 in college. I went and I started just cutting stone. Mm -hmm. um, I cannot call myself a sculptor. I just uh, started just carving, cutting stone with a hammer and a chisel. How many people do that in our schools? And uh, um, it caught my attention a lot. I kept on doing it. Then I had a teacher who just started, um, uh, who was very inspiring. He, he was an abstract expressionist from that old school. His name was Philip Avia. And he just kept on telling me, just don't draw, don't do anything, just carve stone. So I would draw on the stone as I carved and make lines and lines. I would carve, work on a piece of stone for six months, sometimes a year, sometimes two, and just keep on going. And that's what I did. Um, it was very little planning. It was just carving the stone. So I didn't go to art school. I just kept on going to this academy in Midtown called the Art Students League, a wonderful school. And I just kept on going there um, I mean, I to cut stone. I think I was there for almost 25 years. I wouldn't, I just wanted to cut stone. So that's, that's what I did. Um, then I left in 2008 and um, for many years I concentrated in music and in drawing, <coughs> um, mostly drawing in subways. Uh, in my long commutes to different schools in the city, uh, I just would ske sketch. And that kept me going for, for many years. Then the pandemic hit, and, um, and I just, I, re I do remember that I began just going to the park and sketch one, one tree, and kept on just sketching that one tree. Then I moved to another tree next, next to them. And that's what I did for a long time. When I applied to Brack, I sent those three drawings. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the judges seemed to like them a lot. And so I was so thrilled that that, you know, that that got me in. So uh, I, don't, I had no plans, but seeing those trees and seeing those such a large space, I said, I, it, calls, it calls you to draw big. So I started drawing big using newspaper. I would just put newspaper and just draw in the newspaper with ink. And that's, that's, it was like an instinct. I, I don't think I said, I'm going to plan to, I mean, sometimes people go to a studio with very uh, clear plans. I didn't, I just, you know, let it be like the color organic as you feel it and you just go for it. And that's, that's what happened. Then from the large drawings, I will do those large trees and people, um, birds. I started becoming interested in birding. Um, and so I will do that. I will draw a lot of those. 
but in large scale, a little bit like this, uh-huh. this that 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 um, Wimbrel. Um, I was inspired by them, of by the migrations of birds, and so I just continue just drawing big. That's what I did. A lot of your work includes making murals. Could you tell us more about? How did you start to do them? With neural making? Well, it was just a natural um, effect of drawing big. Um, in one of the schools, I was, it was offered that I do a mural. And, um, but I had to have the, the fifth graders, the group, also do one with me. But they also said, you, you, but the mural that you propose has to look exactly as you propose it. So it sounded like I had to do it, and then the kids had to do something else that looked like my mural. So I did a formal mural on canvas. That was our first, my first attempt. And, uh, and, and the kids also did their own, and that was a beautiful thing. We did it in Morris Heights um, in, in the Bronx. Um, and that got me pretty excited about drawing in large scale um, with a formal, more like a wall. Um, then the opportunity came of doing this mural for a, uh, an organization called, called Community Life. And, and um, there, um, I approached them, I heard about them, I wrote to, the, to that um organization, and I show them some ideas. The, the name of the building is a new building. It, it is for uh, very underprivileged communities. Um, there were uh, a number of um, units uh, for women, single women, young single women with children, and homeless, and people with dealing with drug addictions and other things. Um, the, the name of the building is called Borinquen, which is in the Caribbean the, the Caribbean name for, for Puerto Rico. And so inspired by that, I, which is something that I do and love is poetry. Since I was a kid, they always in school picked me to, to say the points of the of the school for for Flag Day or or Mother's Day. So I, I think I have an a, a like or an affinity to 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 feel poetry as part of my life all the time. And poets, I discovered the American poets in college when I started college here in, in New York. Um, but for Borinken I knew about this amazing woman uh, who's one of the greatest poets of Puerto Rico, uh, Julia de Burgos. Uh, she read poetry here in New York. She lived in the Bronx. Um, she lived all over the Caribbean, in Cuba and Puerto Rico, and she loved New York. Um, um, so one of the poems is dedicated, wrote, she wrote it to a river, uh, Luisa, um, and it's uh, her childhood and her life. So I read a poem, I, I illustrated some ideas, and I sent it to the, to the board of community life, and they got very excited with the idea. So from there, we, I took it from there and began uh, sketching large, making large drawings. Um, I got a great painter to join me, Marta Blair, and I asked her, you know, let's, let's do it together, let's paint together. She was the painter, because I'm no painter. Um, so it was a great collaboration, and we put color into the drawings, and the community lab just got very much interested, and we got the contract, and in 2022, we created the murals. Um, it, was a, it was a very long process. The building was just being finished when we entered and we began painting the walls. And they were still doing the floors, the lobby. And um, so we, f- we finished timely and it was very exciting to do that project together. 
I cannot call myself a muralist. It's a, it's too much of a title. Um, but we were able to create wonderful murals. I, I think uh, Marta was uh, vital in creating and putting these colors in the in the walls. Um, but but from there, there was other projects that came up. An organization that does art in schools called LEAP also as uh, they wanted a mural in their office, so I created one there. Um, so the idea, but the most exciting thing was when I started doing large scale works with community. I did one with Hispanic Society, and most recently I did one with Inasukasa Grant, which is a grant for, for uh, uh, senior centers all over the city. Um, and uh, Lower Manhattan Community Council sponsored me. And, and so the, the idea was for, for the participants to read poetry and create these large scale drawings. And I helped them do it, and it was quite wonderful. Um, but this idea of, of creating large works is still something that I love. And I'm still more than a mural, just creating work with paper and charcoal. I have one here. Mm -hmm. and, and charcoal, um, that is just a wonderful thing. Um, drawing is, is immediate and expose you to everything. And it doesn't have to be perfect. It's just there. Whatever it is, it's just, you know, it's an imprint that is immediate. And that's what I like, to uh, do that, doing that with kids or young populations or other people. It's just a beautiful thing to see what they do. So I translate it into here, into my own drawings. When we spoke uh, earlier, you mentioned that pre-Columbian time and Native Americans have uh, a great influence on you and your art. Uh, can you tell us more about what influenced you and what kind of ideas you put into your work? Yeah, the, well, in Mexico, as you may know, there, there is all kinds of, like maybe 59 different languages of Indian or, or native tongues spoken in all Mexico. Uh, and in many places in Latin America, uh, in, in many countries, in Peru or the Amazonian, um, all over. Um, in the United States, uh, there's got to be at least 50, 60 different languages being spoken, uh, native tongues. Um, what's more beautiful about being in this studio is that there, there was this river going down and you can see it out the windows. It crosses, it divides the Bronx in two. And um, I just saw that river and it's just so beautiful. There is a crossroads also. We have Boston Road here, which is the, the first postal road that goes from on, on New England all the way to Boston and further up. Here is the number two and five trains. There are like three or four different highways crossing. And so this is like a crossroads too. With, with, the, with the American Indian, I think uh, these crossroads are very important. This, this, this you know, things that are crossing and, and being, being part of, of life. Um, and uh, well, in, in Mexico, we are educated that we are part of our Indian uh, roots. Uh, um, I'm not sure if that's done in the United States, where you are taught that you th this part of your blood uh, and your culture. Um, so to me, the the uh, the Lenape and the different communities here are and finding their symbols and drawing them gives meaning to the drawings or gives some kind of like uh, wait to, to what I'm doing. Um, there is these drawings that I found in the newspaper of these young Amazonian kids walking. And I just decided to draw them. It's, they're, they're just beautiful. I saw the picture and I just sketch them on my own and then just start playing with those forms. Um, there are 
these photos, this photo here, this, this man and a woman, that's a father and daughter, they are from Paraguay, and he speaks, he is the last two people that speak this language that is this after he dies, and if she doesn't pass it to other people, the language will go. But they spoke, they, he wrote a, a dictionary and a, book, and a grammar book for that language. Um, I decided to draw them, but as, 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 as a native Indians, um, a little younger, but, but with the same idea, this is, this expression for them seems to be saying hello, you know, um, showing hands and showing this, some, this language what we hardly understand or know, um, that is back there, um, bringing it, bringing this thing to the front, to, to our culture is very important. Even if we are not part of it, we become part of it. And only if you want to. And also if education programs make so people more aware of that. So I think that's why it's important to have this brought into the surface, at least in, in the art I'm doing. When I was carving stones, I was always inspired with pre-Hispanic forms. Um, and I was thought I was, you know, I, 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 I always fantasized that I was a nasty reborn carver from those times into modern times and just cutting away, you know. But but um, this this kind of beautiful things is just um, bringing way to a to a, a community that was kept in silence for a long time. And I think it's just good to to put it all together in our lives now. And I just put it in the draw in my drawings. It's, it's it's also beautiful and fun to do. Could you tell us more about the people you draw? Are those uh, the people you you or know? Are those people you see on the street? Yeah, it, 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 there's a drawing on that other side where uh, you know this woman has this very strange like bag and. And it was this young girl that was just sitting not too far from me, and I just sketched her. So I take those sketches and then I, I make them big. Um, a lot of people is a lot of the drawings are people I see. Recently, I've been fascinated with some images, like the one from the New York Times. This is a photo from from when I moved here in 2020 of of a. Um, of an Indian community in the Amazon. And so um, I, I just draw, um, and for some reason, they become somebody I know or something that is more familiar to me. So I start with something that may be an image from the newspaper, but then I kind of make it more familiar to what I know. Um, so it's, it's a bit more of things that I, that I, experience, um, whether I see them in the subway or walking or people that I know personally. So, yeah. Where do you get your ideas for your drawings, for your sculptures, for your murals? Do you listen to the music? Do you, I don't know, look at other artists? Or you just dream, maybe? Um, music is very important and poetry is very important. You know, um, I wish I read more, um, but but um, there's a combination of things of, of um, like I mentioned the the community life um, mural. It was from Julia de Burgos poem on on a river that I just saw a river and I saw these fantastic, you know, creatures and that's you know how I get ideas. Um, a lot, I think, it has to do with with that, with 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 the poems I read. They help a lot in in visualizing something. I sometimes don't understand what the poems say at all, and but you keep them inside and you just you just feel their beauty. I think in in art is the same. Where, excuse me. Um, I don't, I we don't, don't understand what we do. We just put it there. 
it's not my story or anybody's story, something that just, just happens. I like the idea of abstract expressionism because that's pretty much where I came from with this mentor and teacher I had, Philip Padilla. And, and he just said, you know, your hand calls the universe, just let it be free. They really believe that you just, you know, go there and make the art. And, and that idea of not necessarily designing or being careful exactly or, or planning uh, is kind of disregarded. And you say it's more of an action, more of you just totally going in there. So there are many things that happen at the moment. I'm walking in the park and I, this owl flies right by me. So that experience just immediately comes and then there's an owl and there's owls all over the place in my drawings. So, so they, they, like everybody, you know, like your experience, your day-to-day -day life is just very much part of your, of your art, I think. Um, it's more in forms, more in, in, in things that are happening. Uh, it's, it's less about belief or about telling of how people think should think but it's more of saying this this is it you know it's this is art yeah what are your feelings about your new exhibition here at bar okay well it is very exciting uh it is exciting that you are curating the the show um i think um is not necessarily a collaboration, it's trusting a person's... Uh, once you make art, it's none, of you, it's none of the artist's business what happens to it, or what should say, or what should people think about it. And, um, and for a long time, I was really uh, tortured by what people would think about what I did. And I was always expecting, like, oh, it's great, you know, and of course we want that kind of... But, but in, in truth, it, you know, what ever else's experience is, is, that's it. You know, if it's good or bad, who knows? Uh, but you just make it and let it live. And, and so having a curator for the first time helping me, you know, or doing the, the, the show, it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing to happen. Um, how they see the work is a, is a wonderful, you know, experience. And, and so I, I feel it's, it's a very exciting uh, thing now that you will come and see the mural and, the, and some of the stonework that I made years ago. Um, I'm putting it all together. I think it's a, it's a beautiful thing. It's um, how the process of myself trying to be an artist and, and trying to call, say, I'm an artist, I'm a sculptor or I'm a stone carver, but just letting it be and all of a sudden then my hands know that they make art and that, that's it, you know, and, and to see that reflected in a show is a beautiful thing. It's a, well, it's, it's just, yeah, a, a great, uh, opportunity to show what I did in these years, especially the, la the last four years here at the, at, at the, at the Black Studios. Uh, could you tell us more about the title you just created, the Trasos Erantes? What, what do you feel about it? Yeah, the, um, we were talking a lot about ideas and um, um, a lot of the work I do has to do with, also with us moving, m with migrations, including myself, you know. Um, then you see people moving from one place to the other, or birds moving, um, uh, uh, I mean, ongoingly, back and forth. Um, the, the, there is an ambiguity of the title, which I love, uh, um, trazos, trazos errantes uh, are uh, lines that are 
wondering, and I just love that, that thing, you know, the, of us just moving from one place to the other. And I think draw, drawing is also, you know, uh, constantly moving and shifting and it's, it's not affixed. I thought that was um, a wonderful title. And thank you for, we just kind of came back and forth with that. The English version of it is... Lands of Wonder and Soul. Yeah, so it's a it's a, a take on that and in, into the wandering of everyone, you know, um, souls or people or animals or um, yeah, it's, they are they are great titles. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Welcome.